Hi everyone, my name is Ray and I am a tutor here for the Genomics Education Partnership or GEP and today we are going to talk about how to analyze your dot plots and protein alignments that you generated from Gene Model Checker. So when it comes to the analysis of the dot plot and protein alignment, you can think of the dot plot as the cartoon version of a book and the protein alignment as the version that contains the words of the same book. They both go hand in hand. So first we are going to start with the worded version of the book, the protein alignments. So here we are looking at an actual protein alignment generated from Gene Model Checker. And we can see that this is of the gene WRD isoform PJ and we are analyzing in the species Drosophila grimshawi. We always align against the species Drosophila melanogaster because that is our model organism. So what does a protein alignment show? A protein alignment shows us the amino acid sequence similarity between the particular isoform of a gene that you had just annotated and the same isoform of that gene from melanogaster. So in a protein alignment, we read each line as a pair, as indicated by this red bracket here. The top row in each line will be the amino acid sequence from melanogaster. And in this case, again, the gene WRD, we see here isoform PJ, Drosophila melanogaster. And the bottom row is the amino acid sequence of our target species. And it should be of the same gene in melanogaster. We can confirm that here. In this case, our target species will be Drosophila grimshawi. And these coordinates, these amino acids, are based on the coordinates that you had put into Gene Model Checker. So the numbers to the left of the first exon these numbers here indicate the starting position of the first alignment in each species. In this case, both species do begin at one, but in some cases you may see that these numbers differ and don't match. And all that means is that the algorithm of the alignment will always try to maximize our overall percent identity and similarity scores. So in some cases, that might mean that we might have to start a little further upstream in one or both species in order to get that maximum alignment score, in which case we will not see a one starting here. But in this case, we do. And that goes for gaps as well. So here, because we see both genes begin in amino acid one, we can see we have a gap here. We see that Drosophila melanogaster ends at this point at amino acid 60, and Drosophila grimshawi at this point ends at amino acid 43. Again, this is just the algorithm trying to maximize our percent identity and similarity scores. So it recognizes a gap here, and then it picks back up with our alignment at this failing here. We can also see that our protein alignment contains four different colors. We have this orange, light blue, red, and dark blue. And these colors are meant to differentiate between our different exons in both species. So here, orange signifies exon one in melanogaster up until this point, and light blue signifies exon one in our target species up until this point. So this will be the end of exon one. And then we alternate to red and dark blue, and we can follow this down the row see the end of exon two here, and then it alternates back to orange and light blue and so on. So we can actually see that in this particular gene, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight exons. Now that we know how to read an alignment, we can move on to the actual analysis. So between each of our amino acid sequences, we will see a symbol. And this will give us information on how similar each amino acid is between the two species. So we are currently zoomed into the first 
line of our first exon in our protein alignment, and we see an asterisk appears between our first six alignments. An asterisk tells us that these amino acids are exactly the same. They are identical, so they will contribute to our identity score. A colon means that the amino acids are different in structure, such that they are no longer the same name, but they have highly similar chemical properties. So we can see here that there's a colon between D aspartic acid and E glutamate. And we can also see another colon between serine and threonine. So while aspartic acid and glutamic acid aren't identical, they are both polar, hydrophilic, and acidic. So substituting one for the other in this sequence is not likely to have a drastic effect on the overall molecular function of the protein. So this will be considered a conserved change. And the same goes for serine and threonine. We are only missing a single methyl group in threonine, which is likely not to create any drastic changes um, as far as hydrophilicity or create much steric hindrance. Right, so a period then means that the amino acids are different and have somewhat similar properties. Here we see a period between proline and threonine, and proline is nonpolar and uncharged, while threonine is polar and uncharged. So we can see that they share some characteristics, but not all. These alignments will contribute to our similarity score, but they will not contribute to our identity score. So now for our last option, we have simply a blank space, which means no alignment whatsoever. There's either no similarity between the amino acids or there are no amino acids to even align. We see that there is a blank space between that of glutamic acid E, which is a polar hydrophilic acidic amino acid, and alanine A, which is a nonpolar hydrophobic amino acid. We see that right here. And substituting one for the other in this sequence may result in a conformational change and or chemical changes in the protein that may lead to a loss of function. So we do not consider this a conserved change in our sequence. A dash or series of dashes in one sequence then indicates that there is a gap there or amino acids present in one species are not present in the other. In this case, we see 17 dashes within the first line of Drosophila grimshawi, but we see 17 amino acids present in Melanogaster directly across. So because Melanogaster is our model organism, we will always refer to insertions and deletions with respect to Melanogaster. So in this case, we will consider the dashes to indicate a deletion within grim rather than an insertion within Melanogaster. This deletion is then reflected by the numbering system at the end of our first line, such that Melanogaster contains 60 amino acids up until this point, and grim contains 43. So now we will move on to the analysis of the dot plot, which goes hand in hand with the protein alignment. Remember, the dot plot tells the same story, just in a different way. So in a dot plot, we are taking the two amino acid sequences of the gene that you had just annotated. So here are the two sequences. And we are plotting a point in the plot for each similarity. In each way, we can identify exons of great similarity, exons of little to no similarity, repeating sequences or inversions. So we are going to remain looking at melanogaster against from Shawi with our WRD gene isoform PJ. This again is based on the coordinates we have put into gene model checker. So since this is a relatively conserved gene, we have a pretty straightforward dot plot here. Um, while some genes may not be as perfectly aligned, of, um, we are going to see different things up here maybe in this region of the graph or this region of the graph. So that is what we are going to point out in these next few slides here, what we might see happen, what 
weird things might we see and how do we interpret those? So first we do want to establish our reading orientation because this will stay the same for all dot plots. On the X axis, we will have Melanogaster and on the Y axis, we will have our target species, in this case from Shawi. The different boxes then represent our exons. So in the rows, we have exons one through eight corresponding to our target species. And in the columns, we have exons one through eight correspond to Melanogaster. This helps us because we can see right away that exons four, five, and six have really nice alignment between the two species. Um, we can see that a line goes from one corner of the exon to the end of the corner of the exon, um, indicating that this start and end of the exon in Melanogaster is very similar, if not identical, to the start of the exon in our target species. Um, we can also see that exons one and seven have a much lesser degree of sequence similarity than the other exons. And we will talk more about what this means in the following slides. So before going more into depth as to what types of patterns we may see in our dot plots, it is important to note one important feature of the dot plot viewer that we see, and that is word size. Word size is important because depending on the word size you have set for your dot plot, we might see different things happening in the background of our dot plot. So what does word size do? Word size will essentially increase or decrease the sensitivity of the dot plot with respect to the threshold it is set at. So here we see word size and below it we see neighborhood, which will also be referred to as threshold. It is based on this scoring matrix. This is the scoring matrix and this is the particular um, name of the scoring matrix that will create a score for each position of the word size. Then for each position of that word size, if that score is at or above our set threshold here, that tells our generator, okay, we are going to plot a point here or here or here. So let's take a quick example into what this means. So if our word size is one, that means we are analyzing amino acid per amino acid. And this can result in a very noisy background. So typically we have our word size set at three. Um, in smaller exons, we might have it even set at two. So we are going to set our word size at three. And that means we are essentially analyzing in groups of three, right? It is like we are taking these groups of amino acids and looking at them under a microscope. And what we are doing is then based on this scoring system, we are generating a score for each word sized based on this scoring system's underlying algorithm. So what the scoring system will do, we'll look at this match and this match and this match, or maybe this match and this match, or this match and this match, it will create a score for each match based on your word size. And based on this threshold, if that score for this match is at or above this threshold, this will plot a point on our graph. If it, that score is below, no point will be plotted on our graph. Okay, so let's look at what happens if we keep our word size at three and decrease our threshold. Here's our first plot. We see with a neighborhood or threshold set at 11, so we are only going to see dots or marks appear on our graph here where three amino acids are being analyzed from each sequence. And the scoring matrix, based on this scoring matrix, 
if it has given them a score of 11 or higher, then we will see a mark on the graph. So here's our next graph where we see a threshold set at seven with the same word size of three. But what do we notice? We notice there's a lot more noise in this background. This is what I mean as background, right? There's a lot more noise in that graph as compared to this graph. And so what we see is that because we have lowered that threshold for what we want to be plotted on our graph, we have made it so more dots or more lines of that word size will be plotted on our graph. Now are we going to now we are going to see what happens when we keep our threshold the same but decrease our word size. So here is our first graph with a word size of 3. And here's our second graph with a word size of two. What do we notice? We notice more marks for one. We can see here and here and here. Well, we can also see that the overall size of the mark has slightly decreased. So that is, we can see this mark is slightly bigger than this mark, and that is due to the decrease in word size. We have decreased the number of amino acids we are analyzing down from three to two. So in sum, decreasing the word size increases the overall sensitivity of the plot, whereas increasing the word size will decrease the sensitivity. Okay, so in some of everything we just went through, we can see how we can manipulate the graph based on our word size and threshold. This is going to be important in our upcoming slides because we may see stuff above or below our alignment line and we want to know how to read it properly. This will be particularly important if you are dealing with genes of smaller size and few exons because we can see much more in the graph for a smaller gene than we would for a graph five times its size and set at the same parameters. So two sequences with high similarity will show a linear relationship like we see here. Small or large gaps then indicate no sequence similarity between your gene and your target species and melanogaster. And we can always go back to our protein alignment to see this as well. So for example, at position 600 in melanogaster and position 574 in our target species, we can see the similarity starts to decrease. Going back to our protein alignment, we can find that position and yep, we can start seeing that decrease in identity and similarity right where that dot plot indicated. Okay. So in our next example, we see a gene that appears to have a large gap here. And what we see is that this gene has two exons and this gap is occurring right at our exon boundary so the transition into our second exon from the first. And what we want to note about this is that we might not get any fails in our gene model checker. We might get everything to check out for us. But when we go back into our splice site, so this will go into our donor for CDS1, we have our gene model ending at this point here. And we can see that all of our prediction tracks tend to line up much further downstream. So this might be a case where your splice site may be occurring too early or too late. In this case, the splice site is occurring way too early and it's most likely going to occur further downstream down here in this region. So when we adjust for this, we can see that we have a much better alignment after fixing for our splice site. So this is why it's important that when we have a graph where we do get a gap occurring at one of our exon boundaries that we go back into our genome browser and double check that we use the correct splice site and not one too premature too late because we don't just want all passes, we wanna make sure that our dot plot also checks out as well. Okay, so in this example, we have a repeating sequence. And in cases of repeating sequences, you may have a line or a few lines appear parallel to your main alignment here. 
So here's your main alignment. And this is one example of a repeating sequence I put in, but you may see multiple here, right? And so this is because there is a sequence in Melanogaster that matches your target sequence, not only at your submitted location here, like this might be the location that it matches, but it also matches here. So you have two points at which a short segment, most likely on the shorter end, it is more rare to find a longer segment that matches in two different areas of your sequence. So for example, we can read this as this sequence here appears at 250 to 330 in Melanogaster, and that aligns with 240 to 320 in our target species, but also aligns with positions 420 to 500 in our target species. Right, and like always, we can see this in our protein alignment as well. So this is just a made up example of a protein alignment with a repeating sequence, but we can see the, the general trend here. So we can see we have our first sequence appear in both species here at position 295 in Melanogaster and 269 in our target. And that sequence, that YEL, FLR, FLES, PD, FQ, also appears further downstream in our target species here. So this repeating sequence might align again with the other species um, such that um, this sequence might be the same as this YELF, but in this case it is not. But what we will still see this repeating symbol in our dot plot because the fact of the matter is that this sequence has now appeared twice in our overall transcript. So for our next example, we have what appears to be a black box intersecting our alignment. And this is actually indicative of a short tandem repeat. What really is happening is that there is a segment in our entire sequence that has repeating elements. So here are three examples of some short tandem repeats. And if we look at just one of these, so we will look at the repeating ATT. And we see our sequence in Melanogaster here and our sequence in our target sequence here. What ends up happening is that this ATT is matched accordingly to this ATT, but it is also matched to this one and this one and this one, as is the same for this ATT being matched to all these ATTs, right? So we just have multiple matches and that is gonna account for the um, black square-like appearance in our dot plot, but in reality, it will just be a bunch of little dots that create that black square. So finally, for our last example, we have an inversion, which is a pattern that creates a break in our positive slope with a line that is perpendicular to it. And what happens here is we have a short sequence. In this case, it is about 30 amino acids long. That is the same in our target species, but inverted. So if we want to visualize this in the protein alignment, we would have our melanogaster sequence and our target sequence, and we would see our TAAC match. And then we would have TGCA, ACGT, and then it goes back to GGT and GGT. So while this doesn't exactly match, we can see that it matches in this direction and this direction. So the TGCA in Melanogaster and ACGT in our target is our inversion. And then continuing on with the GGT, that is, so we, this might be here, our TAAC, and then here's our TGCA, and then here's our continue on of our GGT. So that would be an example of an inversion in our dot plot. And that concludes our video for protein alignments and dot plot analysis. I hope this helps, and you all have a great day.